All right. Well, thank you, Alfonso. And welcome, everybody, uh, to this talk. So, yes, we are talking about uh, design systems. Um, what should be, what it is a design system, what should be a design system, a good design system, and which are the cultural changes that are needed to achieve uh, that substantial uh, tool. So, first, uh, let's let's uh, discuss or let's start with who am I, right? So, I'm going to just make you a brief introduction about my, let's say, my career and 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 my skills as a designer. So. Okay, great. <laughs> vale, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. I don't know if you can hear me now. Okay. No se oye. All right. Can you hear me? Can you hello. Hear me? Hello. I don't know if anybody on the chat can tell me anything. Hello, hello. One, two, three, one, two, yes, three. Yes, finally. Uh, okay, perfect, good. So, uh, I don't know. Okay, I'm just going to make a, a brief recap of everything that happened here. Uh, just uh, Nacho is going to talk about uh, flame and cultural uh, around uh, uh, design system. And go ahead. <laughs> Please. All right, so I don't know if you hear me uh, anything or just uh, some parts of what I've already said, but anyway, we're here to talk about what it is a design system, but moreover, what should be a design system and which should be the cultural adjustments in in any organization to achieve this, uh, um, yeah, this step forward in, in design uh, and, and the organization of the, of the workflow. So let's start with, uh, well, just a brief introduction of who am I. So I'm going to give you just some, uh, well, some recap of what has been my career on the last uh, years. So first, I, my first contact with, with the design was in 1996 when I started working uh, in, in, a, in an, a graphic design agency. Then in the year 2000, I was a madman for a while, and I started working as an art director in a, in a big advertising agency. But in 2006, I discovered that design was more than colors, it was more than just the aesthetic part, and I became very uh, interested in, well, in information design, reading patterns, conversion rates, and I started to apply those key knowledge on uh, online design. In uh, in 2007, I made a summer trip into the United States, where when the the iPhone was uh, just released, and well, for me it was like uh, something that really changed my my point of view. Not only because of the the hype, but but really when when I experience uh, that, that that device it was like hey this is something that goes beyond the hype it was it, it was something related with the performance well but also with the experience with the way of understanding uh, the business and, and the way of, of uh, doing uh, of getting access to the huge uh, wall of internet through those apps that really uh, make the, the experience and uh, uh, more uh, relevant for for the user so when i came back uh, into spain it was like hey we have to do something on, uh, on on here we i think this we have to focus on those so-called apps and so on oh, well and, and and i think i was not really uh, uh, wrong with with that perception so in 2010 i i became fully committed with the uh, digital design in 2011 uh, I made my first big app. It was the, the banking app for Santander Mexico. It was a huge challenge at that time uh, to, to face with not just uh, designing one or two views, or one or two screens, but also thinking with, uh, with several flows and, and managing that, uh, uh, well, those uh, characteristics that I think a good designer, a digital designer has to have 
that uh, manage the, the design part, the, the product part, the technological part. So in 2012, I made a, a, a step and I became an entrepreneur, which is a cool word, but it's really hard. <laughs> I can promise you. In, in 2016, I became part of, of Santander as uh, well, as I mentioned in uh, years ago, uh, I started my relation with Santander and with, when Santander decided to have an in-house design team, they called me and so I became one of the design leads there. And one year ago, I moved from Santander Spain to Santander Global team in order to lead uh, and to try to align all the all the local teams and all the countries and all the business uh, teams uh, there uh, in order to achieve one cohesive experience. So, what are we going to talk about today? About today, as I mentioned, we are going to talk about what a design system is, but more important, what it should be. I think a good design system has to go beyond component libraries, has to be aim on the creation process. It's about making the time to process, not, not shorter, but more efficient. And we will talk about it. It's about, at the end, improving the quality. So at the end of this, uh, of this uh, talk, we'll talk about all the cultural alignments that, from my point of view, during all these years, have to um, have to happen in a corporation. So, uh, just a few weeks ago, we made public all the documentation of Flame, our design ecosystem. And later, we will talk about why it's more than a design system, but an ecosystem. And so, I would like to talk to you why we end into that, which are the characteristics of Flames, and which are the cultural adaptations. But prior to that, please let me go back in time and, and let me put you in context into the Santander culture, right? So long time ago, Santander were the what I call the the, the Empire Times. It was uh, it was a very centralized organization where uh, everything that happens in the countries in terms I'm talking about uh, of digital products was decided in the in the headquarters. So uh, if um, Mexico wants to, to release a new app, well, it was not only made in the headquarters, but also decided which are the features, which are the, which is the roadmap, which should be, um, of course, the, the visual appearance and, and, and all, the, all, all that time. So that, that's, those are the times of the empire. But that empire was, uh, we've moved into what I call the, the feudal lord's time. Uh, the, the, that link among the, the headquarters and the countries was cut and, and we move into a time of the feudal lords where each of the countries were the responsibles of deciding the roadmap, their features, uh, of course, also the, the visual appearance of the digital products. And well, we've moved into become, we've, we've, we became a large, complex and decentralized organization. This decentralized model has some upsides for sure. I mean, thanks to that, uh, Santander was able to be really attached to local reality. Each of the countries were able to provide a quick feedback to their user. Uh, we gain in agility and flexibility, but also this uh, provokes some, some downsides. Mainly, we, we, we get into a lack of communication. I mean, in, uh, every every digital uh, team was absolutely independent from the rest, with no communications. We we did not know who was in charge in uh, Santander UK or who was the responsible for the latest release of the app in Poland. Not at all. It was for sure no co no collaboration among the different design teams. That uh, led into a diluted branding. At the end, yeah, right. We we are uh, the the red flame, but 
that that's it. Uh, the, the the flame at the end, uh, um, I mean the brand at the end, was not really consistent at all, and that means some poor efficiency. That had uh, tangible consequences, a weak consistency. This is an actual overview of some of the digital products when I start working as a, as a global coordinator of the visual uh, and UI part in Santander. And as you can see, well, yes, we are uh, a white uh, flame against a red uh, background, but which tone of red? We found out of eight red tones, five different fonts, and moreover, it was there were no common interaction or mental model. So, in June 2018, uh, from 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 the top management of the of the group, they, they say, okay, that's it. We have to move. Okay, it's not about coming back and, and being an an empire anymore. But uh, it's not about being so uh, uh, so unconnected among the different teams. So. Uh, the bank decides to launch a 90 days challenge. That means that uh, in, in two different places, in Madrid and, and London, uh, several squads working in Agile building features to be used in every Santander app. Which features? Well, it was about those features that can be uh, placed everywhere. So, for example, a branch locator, That's that has total sense. I mean, what's the point in creating a branch locator in Spain, a branch locator in the UK, a branch locator in Argentina, in Brazil? Instead of that, why don't we do just one branch locator? We made some uh, uh, middleware adjustments to apply that branch locator in every market. As the branch locator, it was a financial agenda, some security layers, and a global design system. So wait, wait, wait a moment. It was like, okay, what? So you're saying that we have to create and adopt by every single country a global design system in just 90 days? So this, I think this would be my first lesson. Please learn to say no. But sometimes we tend to be in, in, in that momentum that lead us to, to, uh, to try to achieve uh, objectives that are not really uh, affordable. But it's also true that when you're in a large corporation, saying no means no delivery. And so people are paying you to give a delivery. So I would say that this first lesson, it's about reframe your objective. So instead of building a global design system in 90 days, it's about it, 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 this is the, 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 the objective that I, uh, well, I, I established and, and I sell to, to the top management. So it was, let's do in 90 days the common elements that will lead us into a cohesive global design. So we start working into the first steps of the solution, what we call a design toolkit. So the idea is, okay, if we build our digital products with the same tools, the results are not going to be the same, but are going to be aligned. And this is what we have to achieve in 90 days. So a design toolkit was made out of some strong branding common tools. So we took the, the branding guidelines that the branding department has prepared and we decline or we took all those definitions into the digital world. So we uh, we took that color palette and translated to the needs that we have as digital uh, designers in, uh, in 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 RGB and all those all those aspects. We took the fonts, we defined the, the, the icons and so and so. We also defined which should be the common design principles that the Santander experience should be like. And we define some UI elements, some components. We create a very small set of the most commonly used components in the mobile experience. Then we uh, create what we call the construction pyramid. This is really important because this establishes how flexible 
should be the elements in that design system and later in that design in, in that design toolkit and later in that design system. So we define that at the base of the of the pyramid should be those elements that admit no flexibility, which are the branding elements. So this is the, the tone of red that you have to use. If you if someone said, I would like to use another tone of red. No, that's not possible. That's the tone of red of our brand. I would like to use another font. No, sorry, we have our cooperative font. You have to use it. So those are the elements that admit no flexibility. Then we have the the common design principles, which which are related to okay. What should be our navigation patterns? What should be our uh, interaction models? That admits a certain point some, some flexibility because we just uh, define which should be the framework, but each of the design uh, teams should have to translate that framework to their actual needs and, and requirements. Then we create that UI elements that at that point it was no it was not a mandatory, so we create a set of uh, some buttons, some uh, text fields, so and so, and we said to the countries, hey, we're thinking about this UI library. What do you think? Do you want to use it? Do you think this um, UI component is better than what you actually have? Okay, let's use it. And please, let us know how which other results. And at the top, with the maximum flexibility, we said to the countries, hey, you, we know that you have some techno technological uh, legacy you have to, to fulfill with some legal compliance, so you have to be responsible to adapt this design toolkit to your requirements. So thanks to the design toolkit, I think we achieved three main objectives. The first was that we forge a global design community because thanks to the construction during those 90 days of that design toolkit we get in contact with all the design teams and all the design leads and heads for the first time in many years we had the confidence uh, of talking directly with the different uh, responsibles in as i said in mexico in brazil in poland in uk we also set up which other design foundations and for the first time we have a unified vision that uh, uh, what should be the Santander experience both from the branding side and from the digital design part. So during several months we've been iterating this design system through that uh, design community that we have forged. We iterate this design toolkit according to four main issues. First, it was how to make this design system, this design toolkit, sorry, more efficient, more simple, with more quality and more consistent. After those months, we considered that it was time to do a step forward. It was time to move from the design toolkit to the design system. And so, in order to have a really powerful and, and, and a really useful design system for the entire Santander design community, we have to have a system, not just a collection of guidelines. We have to be sophisticated, but easy to use. I think this is something key because many design systems, in my opinion at least, uh, tend to be very, very sophisticated, very, very complex, and that means that they are very, very difficult to use because they are very large, it's very difficult, to, the findability of the components, it's very hard, it's, um, it's very hard to, to, to add new components or to um, customize the components in the design system. So from the, from the very beginning, we had very clear that our design system should be really easy to use. The third point is that our design system should be for designers and developers because we believe that we are just one team. We have to have the tools 
and uh, definitions for designers, but also we have to, our design system has to be a help for those in, in, the, in, the, in the development part. And the fourth, it has to be universal. It has to be consistent yet flexible. So let's go point by point. So our design system has to be has to be focused on decreasing the development and design cost, make the time to market fast, increase the quality, and at the end make our designers and developers happier. So we've prepared just um, some a video that uh, express what our design system. So I would like you to spend just one minute checking this, this video and we will continue. This is a short video that, that express uh, the, the main points, the, the highlights, the main points of our design system. Our design system is both global and local, flexible and consistent, accessible and always evolving. So wh what, wh what does it mean being global and local? What does it mean that paradox that, that, is, that, that it's being consistent yet flexible? That paradox, we solve it what, with what we call the Matryoshka doll model. So consider that our design system is indeed a system made out of system. That's why it's an ecosystem. So we have a big tier one, which is the, the, the global warehouse, where we have all the global definitions and all the components. But inside our global design system, we can host local design system for each of our local design teams or business units. So we can have a big design system and inside we can have a design system with the variabilities and, and with the components that are relevant for Brazil, for the corporate banking uh, um, business unit. Uh, and even we can have a tier three so that, that, those are the design microsystem. For example, maybe Brazil has a design system that inherits the components from the global design system, but Brazil has, for example, a team that is uh, uh, allocated just for the private banking. Private banking has their own color palette and has their own uh, components. So. Brazil can create a micro design system for that specific uh, uh, team inside their team that would be the tier three, the uh, sorry, the uh, private banking team. So also uh, design system has to be universal. Traditionally, the there is a, like a, a big border among uh, design teams and development teams. I consider that this is a mistake. We have to be one team. 
we have to build a design system that connects design and development. We have to have one single source of truth. That means that our design system has to have an equilibrium among these three parts of the triangle. It has to be consistent, it has to be flexible, it has to be for designers and developers. This is what it is our design system. And this can be achieved thanks to design tokens. Probably some of you have heard about this concept, but I always love to talk about design systems with some metaphor. All right, so to talk about design system, it's like this uh, famous uh, picture from Madrid. Ceci n'est pas un pipe. This is not a pipe. This is a representation of a pipe. So in the sign, in the same way, this is not a button. This is a button. And a button is made out of different variables that build that button. Indeed, the, the, the design tokens are agnostic transversal variables. So in that way, every button is made of different tokens with, a diff with several values. So we have the token fill, the token uh, border, the token uh, layer, the token spatial, and that specific token may have different values. Maybe the, the, um, the, um, the value of the border is none, or maybe the, the value of the border is uh, four pixels red. So that, that the fact of having all our design components made out with tokens has two main upsides. The first is that we allowed a direct consumption by development teams of the components created by design teams. Traditionally, uh, when a designer wants to consume some uh, uh, issue, some, some component created by a designer, they have to go into Zeppelin, right? And then they have to uh, read how was made that component in Sketch or in Figma. That means that developers have to do an interpretation of what design teams have made. And every interpretation means some transformation. Sometimes when you do an interpretation of every creation, that interpretation can can be quite reliable, okay? can be quite similar to the original one, to the to original one. Some other time that interpretation can be interesting, but many other time that interpretation is, uh, let's say, controversial, right? So thanks to the design token, we solve that because as all our components are made out of design tokens, we have this key element in our design system, which is the design token. Uh, the, the token engine, sorry. The token engine is a scan, it's a scanner that reads all the design tokens that are in every design uh, component and extract th those values in a format that can be consumed directly by development teams. So that token engine can say, uh, uh, can can say to the developers, hey, this is the JSON file uh, that where, where you can read and you can consume directly which are the values of this design of, of this uh, design element. So these are the, the color, this is the size, this is the spacing, this is at the end, this is the, the, the exact description. It's not about interpreting what design has done, it's about consuming what design has done. The second uh, main upside of design tokens, I would say it's about the possibilities of maintenance and variability. So for that, I'm going to use a metaphor that uh, Alfonso uh, here uh, used to, uh, we, uh, likes to, to express, and I think it's a very good uh, metaphor. Okay, let, let's think uh, as each of our um, uh, design components is like a prepared dish, right? So when a designer wants to create a 
a new dish, they have to first choose the ingredients. That means choose which are the tokens. So I'm going to go, I'm going to the token field and I'm going to use a, a certain value. I'm going to use the token font and I'm going to use certain value. I'm going to use a token shape and I'm going to use certain value. Then I'm going to cook that recipe. I'm going to mix all those tokens and then I'm going to have one recipe. So every component that we have in our design system is made with a sketch library, a token library and a documentation. That allows that, for example, when we distribute our uh, components to the designers in the local teams, could happen this situation. Uh, designers in Mexico saying, hmm, okay, I like this definition of the button, but I would like to have it slightly different. Okay, that's, that's fine. Then you just have to go back to the cook to, 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 uh, and cook again that, that uh, recipe. So instead of the token uh, color and decide that you want uh, to use the value tomato red, I'm going to use the value green avocado. I'm going to cook it again and I'm going to have the same component but with a different value. value. That means that every design team can modify the components that we are uh, distributing in the global design system and adapt that components to their local needs. Because indeed, we love flexibility. We love system flavors. Why is that? Well, okay, I want to, to, to talk to you uh, of, a, of an actual example that uh, explains you how important is uh, the possibilities of being flexible. This is the, the button that we have in the global proposition. This is paint with, as you can see, with the, this tone of red, which is the something the red. And the shape is with 100 rounded corners. When we sent this to the Brazilian uh, uh, team, they said, you know what? We would like to have our buttons in this way. And we ask, okay, well, why is that? Why, why would you like to have with a different shape and a different uh, color? And they said, well, you know, uh, we have a graphic tradition and for many years all our digital products have had this size. Our buttons have these four pixels rounded corners. Okay, that's fine. And it's, and, and, and it's totally feasible. I mean, it's it, it would be naive from our side saying, okay, forget all about all your graphic tradition. Now you have to move into this graphic tradition. The, the, the question would be, does it affect into the, to the interaction uh, efficiency that this button is with this size or with this shape or with this shape? Not at all. So that's okay. And what about the color? Why are you using that color? Okay, and they said, you know, in, in Brazil, many people have uh, cheap Android uh, devices. Those cheap Android devices, the graphic... Uh, uh, they they tend to 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 elevate to to raise the the hue of the colors, and so we detected that if we use Santander Red in in large areas, the result is so flashy and annoying that it's not not so nice. But if we use this tone of red, which is actually in the in the in the color palette that we are distributing, uh, this what we call the Boston Red, we detect that as the hue of the device tends to be so high, well, the, the result is similar, more, more similar to what, we, what you uh, try to uh, express than with using the original one. Well, that's perfectly fine. That's exactly the power of uh, on how important is giving local teams to uh, to transform that global proposition to adapt it to the local requirements. I'm from Madrid. I'm 
I'm not able to identify that need that the Android devices in Brazil have that characteristic. I can do that. Uh, so, and that's perfectly fine. That's why we have a design team in Brazil because they are the ones that know knows more about their context and their reality. And we, there's no point that we come back into the emperor times where we decide from Madrid what to do globally. We have to provide some um, some global uh, definitions. The local team should be the ones to decide how to land those global definitions to their reality. So with that, we end into, well, this is just an example. With this, we divide our design system in different tiers so we can have one button that it's um, transformed into different var var variations according to every uh, context or product. That's why I insist this is not just a design system, but a global ecosystem. It's both flexible and consistent. And well, there are many, many points that we could be talking about all the characteristics and, and all, the, the, all the features that are in our design system. But today I would like to talk to all of you about how has been this fascinating trip and which are, from my point of view, the 20 learned lessons that we have come through in order to achieve this uh, design system and which has been the cultural adaptations that we have to move and, and modify in Santander, both globally and locally. So I would say that if you are facing a design system project first before doing anything prior to start you have to scan the surroundings you have to map which is your current situation and you have to start by asking yourself and your stakeholders several questions first which is the starting situation how many design teams will consume the design system which is the head or lead designer of each team. Then you have to, to look if there is any brand department and if there is already any brand guidelines. If there are already any, any brand guidelines, start with that. First, try to identify not only which are the brand guidelines, but understand which is the intention behind those brand guidelines and transform those brand guidelines to your digital requirements. Then you have to do some assessment of about which is the level of design maturity and check if there is already any design culture. Think or uh, count how many design products are already in production, how many design products are planned to be launched, which are the, the outputs or results of these products and which is the current consistency level. With that, and that's going to take you a while, but that's fine. You're actually building a design system, or, although you don't have any library at that point. That's, with that, you're going to have some very val valuable information that will allow you to know where, which are the, the points that you have to modify and which are the people that you are, need to talk with. The second lesson is about expanding your vision. A design system should go beyond design. So UI libraries, of course, are important in the design system, but I would say they are just the tip of the iceberg. I think you, you have to focus on making the design process more efficient. You have to, to broaden your vision and, and make a design system that goes from wireframing to front end to front end to quality assurance. And then you have to evangelize your vision because you're going to find many people in your organization that are going to ask you for deliveries and say, hey, you're working with this for two weeks. Where, where are the libraries? Okay, you have to convince them. 
we are all already working on the design system, but a design system, I insist, is not just about the UI libraries. It's beyond. We have, we are expanding uh, the the features and expanding the vision. Then the third lesson, it's about you have to identify your clients. You have to get to know them and know their circumstances. That means you have to know them deeply. You have to understand which other workflows. You have to understand to which corporate vertical do they belong. Do they belong to, techno to, to technology? Do, do they belong to product? Do, do they belong to, um, uh, to branding, to marketing? Because with that information, you are going to be closer to understand which are their constraints and which are their uh, expectations. Um, also, you have to understand which points, in which point they stand up and in which aspects they weaken. Because you have to spend many time empathizing with them. You have to spend lots of time talking with them understanding which are the pain points, which are the, the their expectations. And with that, you have to always keep a goal in mind. A design system must be a help for them. It must be a help for the design teams, not an imposition. If you try to sell a design system as an imposition, I promise you, you are going to fail. You have to expose how, how a design system is going to help them. Many designers tend to see design system as something that is going to constrain their, their freedom, something that is going to make their life, uh, let's say, more dull, more, more, more boring. You have to, 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 to talk with them and, 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 and understand why do they believe in that way and make they, them understand that a design system is here to make their life easier. Then you have to look for allies. You have to look for those people that can help you in the adoption of, of that design system. And you have to align their objectives with yours. You have to seduce them. Which should be the allies? Well, obviously design teams, but also brand and marketing teams and what I call the design lovers. What's design lovers? Okay, design lovers are those people that maybe they are not part of any design teams or they are not part of any brand team or has nothing to do with design. But are those people that I love design. Yes, I'm... Uh, I love what you do. I I I always uh, want to be a designer. Okay, <laughs> that people can be a pain in the ass because they can be professional opinators. So you have to take the lead and seduce them. You have to make them be aligned with you. So you have to you know you you can take two different ways whether to uh, ignore them which is uh, quite risky, I would say, because if those design lovers are in the top management level, at the end, they are come back to you and say, nah, I don't like what you, what you are doing. Uh, I will do this in this way, although they know nothing about design. So instead of uh, ignoring them, seduce them, talk with them and, and, and expose to them what you are using. If you have the, uh, the authority and you have the knowledge, I assure you, you are going to get those design lovers in love with you and with your, with your task and with your duties. The fifth lesson is about beginning also always with, with a small team. Because for many weeks, you are going to be working on a design teams and you are not going to be able to provide any delivery. So keep the cost at a low level because and that we, if you if you are not uh, incurring in, in, in the high costs, well, no one is going to bother you. 
if you try to have a big uh, team from the very beginning, I think it's going to be very risky. Instead of that, start with a small team and grow that team as the product and the adoption of your design system grows. The six is about, okay, get to it, assume it. You are not the smartest one. There will always be someone who knows more than you. So probably you have read lots of things about design systems, about design, but there will always be someone who knows more about design system and design in a broad sense. So call, uh, look for the best and call them. In that way, I, I met Alfonso in a dinner uh, years ago and well, we, we discussed about it and at the end we are, we are here working together with an um, extremely uh, powerful team and thanks to Alfonso and, we, and, and his team, we have achieved what we have already. So, do not be, uh, uh, do not have, oh, sorry, sorry, do, do, do not be, uh, do not have fear in, in showing that you don't know about everything. That's, that's okay. Just call for the, the, the ones that knows it. What you have to do when you call someone that knows a lot is that you have to learn to identify where the value is. These people are going to get to you with lots of ideas, lots of new features. Well, you, you are the one that has to dis decide what to do first and what to do second or what to do and never, because uh, many times you, it's like, okay, that's a great idea, but not for today or maybe not for this uh, company. So that's okay. That's your task. You have to prioritize that roadmap. And you have to help your team to clean their corporate noise. You have to keep them aside from all those political noises that are going to arise during the whole process. The seventh is about making a, a public statement. The first public statement is about defining what should be a design system. For me, a design system is a tool, no more, no less. That means that a design system has to have one clear goal, make the creation and maintenance process more efficient. That's it. That means that Probably you are going to read lots of, 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 of books and, and articles about design system that tend to make the design system like uh, as the, the, silver, the silver bullet that solve all your problems. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works. A design system is a tool, a very powerful tool, but just a tool. You are going to still need lots of other features, talent, and, 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 and capabilities to, to make a, a really good output. The second public uh, statement, it's about what should be the goal of a design system. Many times you would hear that the design system is about reducing the time to market. I would say yes, but no. It's about reducing the time to market, but moreover, it's about making the time to market more efficient and valuable. So without a design system, normally this is the way uh, we tend to distribute our time, right? So we spend a lot of time in development, lots of time in the UI part, in the, in the visual part, and well, sometime in the UX. With a design system, we can reduce dramatically, drastically uh, the time dedicated to the UI. We can reduce the time to development, and that makes the time for the UX can grow exponentially. With with that, I mean that you can have time to dedicate your talent to what is really valuable. Thinking about the flows. Okay, thinking about if we ha can do this uh, flow or this uh, feature in two steps, three steps, or just one step. 
check if the reading pattern works better in this way or in this other way. Check if uh, um, the call to action is has more conversion rate if we place it in this point of the process or in this other place in the uh, uh, in this other place of the process. That's from my side, from my point of view, what a design system can provide. A design system can it's going to give you lots of free time to explore valuable uh, and very interesting things that many times without a design system we do not have uh, the opportunity to explore. The third public statement that you will have to do is defining how the design system is going to help you as a designer. You have to talk with your design teams and tell them that a design system is not here to make your job. Because, as I mentioned, you have to get them to know that local teams and, and, and designers on the field are the ones that knows better their local context. And therefore, those teams and those designers are the ones that must decide how to land that global definition. So you have to manage the expectation because by managing those expectations, you also are empowering local teams. So in that sense, um, doing some metaphor, I would say that the design system is like the artillery. You are going to provide a big support to the local teams, but at the end, local teams are the infantry. And local teams are the ones that are going to take that trench, are the ones that are going to decide how to attack that trench and take that position. You can support them with the design system, with that artillery effort. But this design uh, system, uh, team, sorry, are the ones that are actually going to do the hard job. And they, and that way you are empowering them about how important are going to be them even with a design system. A design system is not here to make their job. The eighth uh, uh, lesson is about always when you're building a design system, define which is your construction pyramid. Define what's, what should be flexible and we, what should be non-flexible at all. The ninth uh, lesson it's about, I would say, start with the easy home runs. So when you start by uh, defining which are the design foundations, I think that, that's a, a big home run because when you create a color palette, then the color palette is, extreme, it is well crafted. You have think and you have prepared which are the combinations of the color combination that works, which are the color combinations uh, that makes uh, that ensures uh, the accessibility standards are okay. If you create a font or if you buy a font and you distribute it to, you, to your designers, you create an icon family and, and you distribute that icon family, you create those grids because come on, uh, for us as a designer, creating a grid is like, it's not really <laughs> giving you any value. Uh, it's, it's, it's something very tedious and boring, but you have to do it. If, if you are from, if you are start building your design system with those big home runs, that implies that you are going to uh, have a big impact because when all the design products at least have the same color palette, the same fonts, the same icon family, the same grids, it's like, hey, everything starts to look alike uh, in, a, in a very consistent way. And also for designers, adopt those uh, foundations are really a low effort uh, task. It's like, okay, uh, should I have to use that grid? That's great, and, and then I don't have to create any grid. Those are the color palettes and those are the color combination. That's great, I don't have to think about that. So start with the easy home runs. 
The tenth lesson is about enlarging your stakeholders. As I mentioned, making the process more efficient means involving all the teams in the creation process. So do not just focus on the designers, but look also for which are the, your stakeholders in the product part, in the front end part, in the QA part, marketing, brand, and again, get to know them, collect their expectation and identify which is the opportunities that you found out from those conversations. The 11th lesson is about engaging your stakeholders by moving into a model where you create your components and distribute it to your teams to a co-creation model where you, okay, you create components, you, to, you distribute it to your teams, but you also uh, give them the opportunity of creating components and add them into the design system. With that decentralized model, you are engaging them you are you making them uh, feel important because they are important and 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 i think this is something key of any design system you have to take advantage of anything that has already been done if for example the uk team has created uh, as has think or has documented which should be the the inclusive tone of voice okay take it and add it to your design system. If the team from Brazil has created a new way of depicting um, tables or a new way of uh, um, doing the tabs and you think that's okay, take it and make it yours because that's what is about the design system. It's avoiding will interpretation. If someone has invented it, well, use it. Also, with that, you are going to ensure that you have a frequent contact with your clients and stakeholders. Thanks to the, those co-creation sessions, you are going to uh, be constantly in touch with them and you are constantly have that uh, feeling of which are their expectations, which are the pain points, which are the, the features that you have to add in your uh, uh, design system according uh, to uh, those insights that you have received. <clears throat> the 12th lesson, it's about please avoid committee design. When I said that you have to co-create, that's true. But if you want to co-create starting from a blank page, I promise you it's going to be it's going to be inferno. <laughs> because when you go into into a committee and say, okay, let's discuss how do you think it should be our text fields? And you open a discussion, everyone is going to make their own point of view, the other one is going to make their own point of view, and it's going to be very difficult to get into agreement. Instead of that, lead the conversation. Lead that conversation with some initial proposition. So go into that co-creation uh, uh, session and say, hey, now we're talking about text fields. I think text fields should be in this way. And you take uh, your proposition of which are the behavior of that uh, text field, which are the different stage, which is the, the visual appearance, and start discussing from that. That doesn't mean that uh, you are saying, hey, this is the way to do our design, our text fields. Not at all. You are just leading the conversation. You start iterating that co-creation session from an initial proposal. And that's going to make things much more easier. Because at the end, what you have to have in those uh, co-creation session, session is being flexible, but always always keep your vision. So, so you, you have to be very flexible, but uh, you have to be in mind, okay, that's, <laughs> I'm not going to change that. That's 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 against our design foundation or that's against our design principles so keep in mind what's flexible again and what shouldn't be flexible 13 
the hunger theory. <laughs> so this is uh, this is one of my theories uh, that that, uh, that express how can you evolve your design system. So that is that when you're evolving your design system, first you have to establish which should be the different parts or features of the design system and launch those new uh, features as trial balloons. What does it mean? Okay, if you are going to create a new icon family or you are going to uh, launch the, the token values or you're going to launch um, a new definition for private banking. Okay, you can do, or you can, you can. Okay, let's let's say. Okay, I, I'm going to wait until I don't have 500 icons that uh, ensure that uh, covers all our needs. I'm not going to to launch anything, or I'm not going to launch my token definition till I don't have it completely done. Well, instead of that, do do those trial balloons. I mean launch it with small portions so when when you do it in that way you have to wait for your client uh, complaint saying someone is going to say hey the number of icons is very short or those spatial uh, spacing var variable don't solve our problems or hey this is not enough for a private banking product great if you have re received the complaints bingo that means that your clients have taste your dish, they like it and they want more. That means that you're on the on the good path. Then you can improve and you can enlarge those features and improve those features. In many in many occasions, you're going to set to to launch those trial balloons and you're going to receive no feedback, nor positive, nor negative. That means that that's not relevant. Therefore, that means that you have not waste your effort in a new feature that is not really relevant. So always remember, lots of this is but small portions. 14, keep your eyes on the goal, not on the road. So always keep in mind which is your vision and broad objectives. Always keep in mind what's flexible and what is not. And moreover, decide which battles deserve fighting. You are going to have lots, lots, lots of discussions. And if you want to fight every point and you are going to be really, uh, let's say, uh, uh, with, a, with a square mind vision, it's going to be exhausting. Uh, instead of that, decide which time it's, oh, it's okay, let's do it in that way or okay. That's, that's something that, that really doesn't uh, add any value or doesn't affect to the core of the project. Therefore, let's move it, let's, let's adapt it. That's, or there are other ways that really goes against your vision. When something goes against your vision, fight for it. It deserve it. Fifteenth, small boats also cross the oceans. So, you have to embrace, in my point of view, Agile's mindset about MVPs. So do not wait to have uh, the, a trans-oceanic design system. Do not wait to have a design system that it has all the features, all the problems solved, has uh, hundreds or thousands of components, no, I think you have to start with small boats, with a small, uh, small definition, a small MVPs of design system. Those small design systems are easier to modify its heading, are better to explore routes, because otherwise, if you, ex if you wait to have the design system, well, probably you are going to waste your money, efforts, and resources in something that maybe is not what your company really needs. 16. Don't get in love and be prepared to kill your kids. Many times when you're facing a new project, 
you have lots of new ideas, new initiatives that are great, but just in your mind. Uh, so always confront your ideas before landing those ideas into an actual uh, feature or an actual um, framework or an, or an actual tool. Confront that ideas with your uh, stakeholders and clients. Ask them, what do you think? I'm thinking about doing that. What do you think? That will give you some uh, value, some ideas about uh, how feasible it is, which is the, the, the relation among the efforts and the benefits. And that's okay. If you have an idea that doesn't, uh, that it has not very, it hasn't been received positively, well, that's life. If you have launched something and has been a failure, well, that's it. Failures are always learning. And I think we have to, we as digital designer, we have to get rid of the fear of failing. Failures, when you are able to read those failures, are always great ways to, to learn and to make your product in the midterm much more powerful and efficient. The 16th uh, lesson is uh, tools and frameworks are always welcome. Because when you create new components or new tokens, that's fine. And, and people are going to receive it with uh, normally uh, with open arms. But when you create new tools or frameworks, uh, they are always very well received. At least that's my that's my experience. I mean, when you create a new tool uh, that uh, that uh, that helps uh, teams to have their own uh, illustrations or uh, a framework uh, that helps teams to generate new app icons, or you create an aptic definition uh, where you establish which are the uh, the axis uh, to have an aptic experience and you allow local teams to play around with those tools, it's like, hey, people like to play around and, and they always very, <laughs> very positive. So, for example, this is an example and, and in the video was already shown uh, the illustration uh, tool. So with that illustration, you can as a designer, you can play around and from an initial illustration, you can play around and modify its um, tone of, of, of skin, its, uh, its hairdo, the color of, of her clothes, um, some parts of, of their legs, uh, add a new background, so on, so on, so on. So you give them the opportunity to play around with a closed set of uh, options. Because otherwise, uh, if you obviously if you open too much the the options at the end, that cohesive experience is not going to uh, to be achieved. But if you give them the opportunity to play around with a close set of, of options, at least as I said, that's my that's my experience. Those uh, those um, kind of new features are very well received. 18. Design systems are a great means to expand corporate responsibility issues. So, accessibility is, uh, for example, in, in Europe with the new European Accessibility Act, that is going to be uh, have accessibility standards. It's not just a recommendation, but a re legal requirement. Therefore, accessibility has to be a key element in your design system. In my opinion, uh, design products for all means designing better products. I mean, because at any time we can be disabled people. And let me put an example. If we're uh, doing a grid withdrawal of money in an ATM and we have the, the sun in our back and the sun is lighting to the, the, to the screen of our ATM, if that ATM doesn't has not been designed with a high contrast uh, definition, with a, an accessible point of view, 
we are not going to see anything on that screen. So at that point, we are temporarily disabled. If we have done our designs with an accessible perspective, we are therefore designing products for all and we are designing better products. So always place your uh, UI libraries that should be at least AA accessibility compliance. You have to also uh, place uh, in the documentation translate the web content accessibility guidelines in a in a contextual and easy way to use and that's my recommendation at least uh, do not please place uh, the accessibility information in an in a separated uh, chapter or uh, like saying okay i have to fulfill with the accessibility documentation then the last two chapters are going to be are going to be about uh, accessibility. Instead of that, why don't you place that accessibility information all across the documentation? So in that way, you are also giving the information about how relevant is for your company, the accessibility and the uh, inclusivity. The 19th uh, lesson is always measure and rethink. So prepare once you that you have done your design system, think into a model to identify which are the actual efficiency. Think about a model to identify to identify sorry to identify how much your design system is being used and how much your design system is helping your company to improve its efficiency. Those are actual screen views of the dashboard that we have in Santander where we measure uh, the efficiencies of our design system. Thanks to that, we have identified that we are uh, saving around 36% of hours in UI design. And also we are launching a uh, user start satisfaction service and with that, those service, we, for example, we identified that uh, as the design system was growing and growing and growing, the findability of the components was uh, becoming quite hard. So we identified that and we uh, create a new information architecture. We also identified that, for example, there were some opportunities to grow in our design system. For example, we identify, thanks to that survey, that we had nothing to relate it with data visualization, that we as a bank, we are constantly dealing and struggling with those needs, and therefore we are uh, uh, preparing uh, uh, a new release of the design system that will have those components ready to be used. And last but not least, give credit. I mean, if your design system couldn't happen without many people, then many people should be part of that recognition. Remove your ego. Everyone, even if it was just one conversation or it was, was just uh, they, they help you with, in, a different, in a difficult situation or they just give you some documentation or, or give some advice, well, give them recognition. So thanks many, many people. Alfonso is one of the people here and I think there are many other people in this room. So thank you all uh, sincerely uh, for uh, taking us into here. And well, this is just the beginning of the, of the road. We will continue improving uh, Flame Design System and making it uh, a helpful tool for many teams in Santander. And well, that has been all from my side. I don't know if you have question or concern. Okay. I'm all yours. First of all, thank you. I just want to check that everybody can hear me now, uh, just to, you know, not continue with these long traditional screen up on online events. So uh, if, uh, if nobody is saying anything in the chat, uh, presume that, you know, everything is okay. So All right. let's continue with him. Uh, perfect. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, you know, 
first of all, uh, this is the first time that we have, uh, you know, such a large uh, organization. Um, so the, the, it is great that you know, in in insight, uh, you, you can uh, you can give us the, the the insight from you know from uh, from Santander point of view and focus on the cultural level. So uh, till people start putting questions and and, and we can, you can answer them. I, I, will, I will. I was thinking as like from the top of your mind, what it will be uh, the major and the big. Uh, if you had to give a, a you know a, a something uh, to somebody who in another big and large organization, uh, something that you know you don't have to miss this when you start when you are doing the, your design system. What it will be? I would say. Um... Yeah, uh, especially if you're if, if it's on, on a large organization, take whatever uh, time you need to map your current situation, to identify which are your stakeholders, to identify how many teams are you going to deal, which are their needs, their expectations. Um, otherwise, um, you're you're going to launch a design system that uh, probably it's very powerful. Uh, but maybe it's not what your uh, organization really needs. So prior doing anything, uh, spend as many time as you need talking with the actual people that are working on design and or has relation with design as developers, as uh, product, uh, as QAs. Uh, be because with that, you, you, you're going to, to have a, a clear picture in some cases, uh, maybe it's it's about okay. We just have to do some visual definition. In other, it's about we have to do some uh, connections with the design and developments. In other, it's about the problems. Is is the connection of the business side with the design side? I, I think that's that's the the first part. Uh, the, the the other part, it's um, always think uh, in a design system as part of the entire process. Do not just focus on on the design part. Uh, that's going to be, yeah, as I said, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, that's going to be useful for sure. That's not, there's no doubt about it. And then for and maybe, probably you, you, you will have to need to start with, with that side. But if you really want to make step forward and you really want to uh, to change things deeply go into the process those I think were my my two main um, uh, recommendations okay good thank you look we get for here the first question thank you uh, it's from Gorit Van Hertrum. I'm sorry for I'm probably um, I'm saying something awful uh, with, with your name but you know I'm really sorry. Uh, if is your design system focus it only on visual design, or does it also incorporate UX principles? That's, okay, that's that's really that's a really good question. According to our uh, to our iterative point of view, we have created the the visual part. We have also documented some uh, some parts related with UX, mainly with uh, navigation patterns and with reading patterns and UX writing, for example. But from now on, this is one of the things that I think has to be the, the key in, in, in our new, uh, uh, new releases. It's about we have to think not just providing single UI components, but providing templates and providing um, broad solutions. Uh, in, in banking experience, there are several flows that we have identified that are quite common. And we have lots of data, of user data, that uh, with that data, we can know which are the, the flows and, and uh, that works better in terms of user experience. And absolutely, we are just uh, about defining which are those um, templates and which are those UX frameworks to be added in, in the next releases. Yeah, okay, great. Look, the next question uh, next question comes from Paula, Paula Sempere. And could you tell us a little, a little more about how do you monitor the adoption of the design system? Uh, did you get data from InVision or, or SketchCloud? 
Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's a good one. Um, indeed, this is one of the key elements that we have asked uh, both to sketch and envision to have to 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 be able. Well, this is something that I have not mentioned, but uh, we are distributing our design system through DSM, Design System Manager by Envision, which allows us uh, that all the design teams in Santander are consuming the latest version of the design system. And what we have asked to Envision is that we want to know exactly component by component how how much is that component being used in which uh, in which uh, um, project so on so on so this is something that we are uh, are uh, preparing that uh, technological uh, capabilities and we hope to have it uh, ready for the next year with uh, Figma that we're thinking about uh, also supporting Figma, which is uh, becoming a bigger key player. We have that uh, more uh, more ready and therefore we, we hope to have that solved. So how we monitorize how the design system is being made? Well, luckily, thanks to that design community that I, I talked to all of you, where we are keep in contact with them. So whether the, those people, those local teams tell us, hey, we are using that design system in that, but also as all the teams now we are using the same Envision account, we have a corporate Envision account, we can have access to all the Envision uh, projects and therefore we are able to check how and, and in which products is the design system being used? Okay, perfect. Look, uh, next question again for Gorit. Uh, can you elaborate more about on how the design system is used in in the handoff uh, to developers? It is there mm -hmm. a technical relation uh, to the actual CSS? Yes, yes, absolutely. So, um, so as as. All our components, both for mobile and for um, both for web, are tokenized, and therefore all our components are made out of those tokens. We have that uh, piece in there that I mentioned, which is the the design um, the design engine, the token engine. Sorry, that token engine reads all the information, all the values of each of the components, and extract a CSS that can be modified according to the syntaxis or to the needs of each of the development um, teams. So what we can have is that a button or a table or a text field, we can have all that information as a, in a JSON CSS adapted to Swift, to Last, to CES, um, to LESS, uh, to XML for Android, and then can be read it by this uh, by uh, development teams. Those uh, those package of information are distributed to MPN in a Nexus um, pipeline that we have in the bank, and therefore all those all those uh, development teams can have access to that definition directly. What we would like to do uh, in the in the very next future is not just having the definition. Of the of the design components, but also have a com complete library of components. Probably we'd like to do it in 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 web components uh, with not just the definition of the components, but also adding behavior and functionality, and therefore distribute with that distribution through MPN All developers in Santander can have access to a complete set of UI components, as I said, just with the snippet code ready to be copy and paste, let's say. Okay, perfect. Uh, look, we got um, uh, another question from uh, Soul of an Angel 2. Uh, how has the design system been validated? How fast the design no, system no. is validated? How has the design system been validated? I mean, how do you validate? Did you validate the design system? or through the whole process existence of the design system, was the moment that you validate that your uh, value proposition is useful for the organization? 
Well, I think that's... Uh, if I tell you it was validated on that particular time, I think that would be a failure. I mean, I think uh, that would, wouldn't be uh, a nice way of doing that. Precisely, instead of doing just one single validation or saying, okay, this is the validation time, or this is the week for validating, we're constantly validating. We are doing constantly updating and improving the design system launching those trial balloons, those uh, hunger theory that I mentioned, and constantly, uh, and I promise it's constantly uh, um, confronting those new, uh, those design, that design system with local teams. We also have something that I have not talked about it, but in, in order to, to ensure that we have um, uh, a nice way of, uh, of um, I mean, a government uh, uh, model for that, we have what we call the Global Task Force. A Global Task Force is a regular meeting that we have the heads or the leads of each of the team that are actually using the design system. And in that meeting, we discuss about new components created locally and we share those components created locally with the rest of the teams. And then we evaluate if that uh, component deserves to become part of the global definition and therefore can be is validated and be used globally or if it's just used in that particular country or if it's just not even a component, it's just a, a snowflake a component that uh, it's not going to be reused and therefore doesn't deserve to be part of the design system. So we're constantly validating the design system. We are constantly uh, thinking and rethinking about if what we are doing is uh, on the, on the, on the, it's really uh, valuable or not. For example, last week we had a conversation with a team from Argentina. They are, uh, uh, taking the values, the the, the, the design uh, principles and the design foundations, and they are uh, rethinking in a midterm evolution of the visual uh, layer. That's fine. We are we are open to constantly uh, revalidate and rethink about our releases. I don't think that's uh, uh, solve your question. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, next one is going to be from Maria Rey. Uh, does DSM work uh, work well for native apps? Uh, I mean, a suitable component for iOS or Android, for example, could be extracted from that? I mean, that, I don't know if I understood that. The, the, the question, I mean, DSM is, uh, it's, uh, we call it, it's the delivery guy, right? So our design system uh, can be distributed or any, any design system can be distributed in many ways. Uh, but at the end, when you have lots of libraries as, as it's our um, situation, well, then the, the traditional way are as we um, used to do it when this was like, okay, we have a mailing list and hey, here you have the zip uh, uh, the zip package, please unlock it, uh, detach your uh, libraries of your sketch and uh, um, link to, to this new uh, package of, of libraries. Well, it was not really, uh, um, it was not really useful. And at the end, many teams were not, uh, are using an updated uh, libraries. So what the DSM does is that connects your, our design system with the sketch of each of the design um, team member to use our design system. In that DSM, uh, you will find lots of libraries. You will find some uh, libraries for uh, with um, native components to be used in Android or iOS com uh, applications or you have another library to be used in uh, web uh, applications. So uh, uh, you can use, uh, as I said, uh, the DSM 
to uh, distribute your design system in, in, uh, in a nice way and, and be sure that all your designers are using the latest version. Okay. And here we have a, the latest question that comes from uh, Tomas Anton Escobar. Uh, how do you deal with cultural and social aspects of each country? Uh, you know, language, tone, pictures, and also how do you deal with the legacy of each backend system of each country? All right. Well, that's uh, that's that's key. I mean, for for us, the, the, the what we have done, for example, in terms of the cultural um, um, aspects, for example, uh, well, I mentioned the, the the example, which is just a tip. Uh, an example of the with the buttons in the global definition and in the Brazilian definition, but it has to do also with the with the with the graphical uh, tradition and, and and well with with the context. So we encourage uh, local teams to translate the global definition into their actual needs, into their into their cultural needs. And, and that's why I think it's extremely important in, in big cooperation as ours to have very clear your construction pyramid. Be clear from the very beginning what should they have to, what should be rigid and what should be flexible. I mean, if someone from UK say, I don't want to use the Santander font, I want to use Helvetica. Well, come on. I'm sorry, but uh, that's uh, there's no discussion about that. Uh, that's part of the branding element. So it's not about my design, my decision even. But if someone uh, from um, I don't know from Chile says that, uh, well, or from for example for, from from Dallas, they said uh, which is one of our teams. Well, our CTAs tend to be in what we call the um, um, the the dark dark uh, blue that's fine dark blue it's part of our color palette yes it is so yes you can use uh, the CTAs in that color if that's according to your tradition or with the the way uh, the um, your cultural aspects uh, tend to um, to interpret uh, design also in terms of of documentation we have prepare a very extensive documentation which is in English in English as the, the lingua franca but we are actually translating that documentation to the different languages when saying translating is not just I'm going to go into Google Translator and translate it no it's about um, we are doing that translation with local teams to for example and that's a, a, an actual example. In the case of Chile, uh, they are have they are very aware about the accessibility issues, and therefore we are working with their accessibility team uh, to uh, to transform, to modify, or to highlight several points of what we already have to their needs and to their legal compliance. And about the second part of the question, which is related with the uh, with the backend legacies, absolutely. And and that's that's something that we have to we are very aware. And uh, when when you try to make the adoption of a design system, you have two ways, right? You, you can try to do a big bang. That means that from tomorrow at 12 a.m. All the teams are going to use this design system and all the teams are going to be using this uh, uh, coding language. That can be used if you are, I don't know, in a startup and you're, you're just uh, beginning and you are start starting from the beginning. But when you're uh, uh, trying to do the implementation of the design system, a big bang approach is not going to work. So. Uh, in, in those cases, you have to establish uh, an ambitious but realistic uh, uh, roadmap and, and try to, to identify which are the points that you have to, uh, to, to implement from the very beginning, what's going to be next and what's going to be uh, at, the, uh, at the end. So 
for, for with that you are going to have a clear picture that okay for this year we're going to be happy if all the teams are using our ui components and if we are using the token definition in its definition level for the next year then we are going all move into uh doing to move into react for that we need to do a translate uh, a transposition of our te technology doing this this and that and for the third year we're not just going to have the uh the react uh definition but also we are going to have all this we are all going to have the same uh, technical architecture and for that we're going to need this this and that i think that's that's the key you have to insist in large corporation identify the current situation identify which is your goal at the mid and long term and 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 decline which should be the objectives to achieve that okay perfect look we got a, a, a the last question that we got here on the list is come from uh Fonso barrio nuevo and first of all thanks a lot for the presentation nacho many times it's very complicated to obtain kpis when the product portfolio is quite large like your case. Uh, so which tools do you have, I mean, do you have used uh, to gather that 56% uh, time saving? All right. <clears throat> so for, 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 for that, that's also true that it's a, it's, um, it's a theoretical model to be, to be honest with you. That, that doesn't mean that it has no value. So what we, what we do in, on a regular basis, is that we made some what we call some lab experiments. So uh, we uh, take one uh, random project worldwide, and we measure. We take we double uh, the, that that effort for what that single project during one day, and we monitorize how that project is being done by a designer using all our design system and by a designer not using our design system and during one day and in a random way we monitorize which are the difference and which are the results and which are the efficiencies with that we get into a number of, of hours saved that that number at the beginning was one number and every around two or three months we do those tests and thanks to that we are refining that uh, that number of course it's a theoretical um, approach it's hard for me to say it's absolutely for every project is going to be 36 percent but as we do that on a random basis and and in different markets we are uh, able to say after several months that we are around those uh, those figures um, also uh, we are uh, doing those service uh, with with that that allows us to know directly in an anonymous way from all our designers saying hey uh, i think the 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 new url uh, icons definition is crap because this and that and that, or I love the way information architecture, or I think we're, we don't have uh, enough things for complex tables. That's the way we are right now uh, trying to make uh, or trying to get to know how to improve our design system. Of course, as we use more and more and more and the adoption rate of our design system keeps growing, and therefore, as the the amount of people on teams are using our design system, then we collect more data and we are refining that uh, efficiency rates and we are getting more relevant information about which should be the next steps to be done. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that, uh, I mean, uh, two people at least ask, uh, ask you about, uh, you know, two things that actually uh, all the people, oh, I think that many of the people who are inside of the design system community is uh, is is looking for and is clear KPIs from the qualitative aspect and the uh, um, and the other one that I don't know what to say right now. Uh, so <laughs> that one, that is that, that is actually one. Okay, so 
it, it will be great uh, because I know uh, that you are uh, you sent on their organization are, are are talking with tools, you know, and, and a little bit. What is the thing uh, that what is your impression, you know, like the tools are going to help to the design system community on the sense of providing uh, us providing you as Santander organization those KPI, those KPIs on the form uh, that, that you need in a near future or you think that we are far away from uh, that promised land where you know we can read uh, the, you know uh, those values well I, I think um, and, and it's absolutely relevant that there are several questions related with the KPIs and and and, and, and the, the conversion rates and so on because uh, well for for many corporations uh, those are key elements when when you work in a bank and when you deal with people that are financial people that becomes more and more relevant and for us that's key and well that's I would recommend if someone here from a startup that wants to invest in creating a KPA model I think you you have a, a a big opportunity there because I promise you, uh, design systems are becoming more and more important, and the more important they are, the the the, the companies or the corporation are going to ask us, as designers, okay, I invest this amount of hours of people of, of money in this design system, which are the results. That's why we 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 consider that this is key important, and we we are trying to to get those numbers and so unfortunately uh, the, now there are at least there are no uh, not enough uh, tools to monitorize uh, those results but i think that's just a matter of of, of the maturity of this tool and we are just uh, in i don't say the beginning of the of the era of the design system but we are just uh, uh, we are not in the um, in the peak of the design system yet era. Uh, so I think um, uh, design systems are going to be uh, more and more uh, a key element uh, in large corporations because um, the, the digitalization is not the future, it's the present, obviously. The number of, com of products is going to increase and it's going to maintain in a high rate for many, many years, I expect. Um, we're going to need to uh, to use our talent uh, many times uh, in uh, by exploring new ways, but many of the times what we are going to need, it's a framework that allows us to do things quickly in a coherent way, in a cohesive way, and with a, with with a quality that ensures uh, some minimum quality, right? So I think design systems are going to be key on that. But we don't have to to remain at that level. I consider that if we just consider design systems, I insist, are just for reducing the, the time to market them, design system is going to be just a commodity. We are just going to be uh, view makers. Uh, and, and, and our value as a designers is going to, to decrease dramatically. We have to use design systems to use our time in what's really it's valuable. We have to use our talent uh, in thinking about the flows, thinking about uh, conversion rates, thinking about new ways of uh, exposing the information. That's where the value is. And we have to use design system to not reinventing the wheel, to not spending our time in yeah thinking uh, again about how to do the 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 the, um, the button or how which should be the values of an elevation of a button when in the hover state. Th that's fine, and but let's do it once, and that's it. And let's revisit those decisions, those visual layers uh, every time. I mean, uh, um, one. I don't know, once in a year and revisit and do some uh, reskins, that's fine. But uh, do not waste our time and value uh, in, in, those, in those aspects. 
for that, I think that's it, that's key uh, design systems in big and non-big corporations. Okay, perfect. Okay, Nacho, so that was the last question. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for the presentation. I especially thank you uh, for, uh, in our name, you know, the Design Scale uh, Community Madrid Barcelona, uh, you know, this openness from uh, an organization like Santander. And I hope that, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, everybody likes your presentation and just that, cool. just thank you. Well, it was been a pleasure, really, uh, total pleasure. And um, well, do not hesitate asking me through uh, media, I mean, through LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, if you have any other doubt or, well, any other session like this one, I'd be happy to be with you. Okay, perfect, great. Uh, okay, for the rest of the people who are following the, 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 the event right now, just telling you that, you know, all the people who are uh, helping to organize uh, this event, and I'm going to go through them, Abraham, Antonio, Daniel, Sara, Turo, and Victor. We're working hard to bring you uh, new people, new organization, new point of views, uh, new subjects about the scale uh, challenge that we all facing. And we hope to, you know, uh, publish really, really soon uh, the next events. So thank you all and hope you uh, have a great time with Nacho and Santander with us. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you so much. See you.